I'm very much convinced that all successful societies embrace the idea that intolerance against any of us diminishes all of us. But there's no denying that that is a creed that has been seriously undermined by growing polarization in Canada and globally. How do you think we can build a social consensus that combating anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are the callings of all Canadians, and not only Jews and Muslims, that none of us can be free if any one of us is left in chains? A zero, a very important, we have a zero tolerance uh, policy with regard uh, to hate. And uh, that should be across governments, parliaments and the like. And this leads to the second point, and that is that uh, to guard against the weaponization of hate, in other words, calling it out only in the other, let's say, political party or in the other, and not in your own. So one has to, uh, each, I think, community has to ensure that its own community is not engaging in hate at the same time uh, as we call out the hate against uh, other communities and hate, uh, generally speaking. The third thing is, you know, getting back to what has been, for me, always the most important thing, that this uh, toxicity uh, undermines uh, tolerance for all of us and undermines, in the end, you know, democracy for all of us. So I think there's a an individual and a collective responsibility for us not to be uh, bystanders or uh, indifferent uh, when we uh, witness hate or experience it. So it has to be called out, it has to be uh, confronted, it has to be uh, combated, and I think if we can work together in allyship and common cause, and here I think, you know, the uh, targeted minorities, uh, those who are the targets of a uh, stomach of race, racism and, and hate, uh, should themselves uh, be part of an organizing coalition against hate. One of the things that worries me, uh, as I said, is the sort of instrumentalization of hate and where it is turned sometimes by minorities against each other rather than minorities working in common cause with each other, let alone when uh, governments uh, engage in that kind of uh, weaponization of hate for uh, political purposes. And we see this increasingly south of the border uh, in where a, a, a polarizing uh, society has, in, in fact, been uh, weaponizing hate. Uh, we've seen some of this here in Canada as well, and I think we have to guard it against that uh, weaponization and politicization of hate, and each of us individually and collectively take responsibility for the hate within our own uh, communities as we call it out outside. I'll ask one last question, just jumping off on Erwin's remark about recognizing discrimination within ourselves. So just as the Jewish and Muslim communities endure intolerance from others, it's inevitable that as communities of scale, they will harbor at least some individuals who visit intolerance upon others. So for both of you, in your work encouraging Canadians to confront discrimination against the Jewish and Muslim communities, do you feel that you have a role in encouraging the Jewish and Muslim communities to confront discrimination within themselves? Are Canadians in general receptive to the argument that we must have the personal strength to remedy our own frailties if we are to have any hope of summoning the collective strength to remedy our country's frailties. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, for me, it, it's crystal clear. Um, you know, we, we are a shared human family. You know, we, we have our shared humanity. Um, and I think that, you know, when we look at um, across communities, um, there are shared values that we can all agree upon. I think there is, I, I can't imagine coming to any or hearing from anyone that would say, you know, that a human does not deserve the freedom to be who they are, to participate in society. You know, if you if you take it at a theoretical level, I mean, it, it would just boggle my mind if someone said, no, I, there are some humans that just don't deserve that. Yes, that's what they perpetuate when they stereotype a particular group because they've been dehumanized. But if we if we bring it back to the essence of just being a human, um, I think it's so important that we that we, of course, um, in our in, in through our example of uh, participating in opportunities to talk about those shared values, to talk about the importance that we have 
to work together um, to combat discrimination, racism, wherever it, it appears. And, and I just want to say, you know, you know, there, there is, I believe, actually a social consensus in Canada that we have to combat anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and other forms of hate. I mean, it's, it's important. I, I want to recognize that Canada has um, an anti-racism strategy. Uh, it had it from 2019 to 2022. It's currently being revised by the federal government. In there, you know, you have very clear definitions of what we're talking about when we talk about Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, other forms of racism. You have, you know, clear information about how we hope to see the government and how the government wants to address that. But it really helps to, to be sort of a thought leader on how we do this work. There's also been commitments just in this past budget at the federal level to, um, to have a new strategy to combat hate. Um, and I think that's so important to see as well in Canada. It's a recognition that indeed, um, you know, hate exists, sadly, and we want to figure out the best strategies uh, to address it and counter it. And and I just, I want to sort of um, kind of, I think, sh- you know, I guess maybe close or, or come to to uh, to a, a, a point here um, to give some hope. Because, you know, I, I am motivated by hope and inspiration uh, that, that really is informed by the vast majority of Canadians that that, that I know, uh, you know, are out there. The the often oftentimes called the silent majority, right? We're you know we're all busy living our lives. We're not on social media spreading hate. We're we're busy doing positive things, right? So we have to remember that that's that's the vast majority of us. Um, and there are beautiful examples where people come together to to sort of foster exactly the society we want. Just last night, I was at an event where um, uh, it was uh, an organization celebrating, um, you know, member of Parliament David McGinty, who had brought forward um, and passed um, an act to, you know, designate April as Arab Heritage Month. And, you know, he stood at the podium talking about it and he said, look, I'm, you know, I'm Irish Catholic. I brought this forward. You know, I, I, I brought this um, motion forward. And in, you know, Mark Gold is a Jewish Canadian senator who's bringing it forward in the Senate. And we're doing this to, to, to create Arab Heritage Month for April. Isn't this an incredible example of people coming together, you know, simply in the recognition of being able to celebrate and acknowledge and demonstrate that respect for the diversity of this country? I, I, I just thought that was a beautiful example. And, you know, and, and, and finally, when... Um, Professor Kotler talked about, you know, the 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 synagogue that it, the school that had been that had been firebombed, um, or the the Peterborough Mosque a few years ago that had been uh, also firebombed. Uh, you know, that story I remember it so clearly because you know local churches actually helped fundraise to rebuild the mosque. Um, they offered uh, the community places to pray within within uh, their buildings. Um, so there are so many positive examples of Canadians every single day countering uh, the forces of division that are out there um, and just through action, through acts of love and kindness and service, really walk the walk on what it means to live in a country that are that is based on pluralism and human rights. So so it's a privilege to do this work and um, I really appreciate having an opportunity to, to share these reflections.